this is newer and dumber. So let's save for a moment the self-defenestration of former special counsel and perhaps soon former attorney Robert K. Herr and begin instead with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. identifying his top two picks to be his vice presidential running mate, Aaron Rodgers and Jesse the Body Ventura. Because the Dilbert guy and Kurt Schilling and that weirdo who used to play Roseanne on the Roseanne show, I guess they're too mainstream. The New York Times scooped this and the fact that the domain name KennedyRogers.com was registered last week. Aaron Rodgers seems a natural to run with Kennedy. Vaccine denying asshole. Perfect. With the hallucinating New York Jets quarterback as his veep, RFK Jr. could christen their ticket the Brain Damage Party. And if you're asking, how could you be vice president of the United States and quarterback of the New York Jets at the same time? That's the easy part. Based on 2023, being Jets quarterback, Rodgers, would take only three and a half minutes out of the year of vice president Rodgers. Hell, he could be back in the vice presidential residence at the Naval Observatory by halftime. Perfect team. A vice president with no connection to the real world and an admission he has used hallucinogens and a president with no connection to the real world who has not admitted he has used hallucinogens and who thus may or may not know he's just a stalking horse for Trump. With Aaron Rodgers, four-time football most valuable player who somehow could not translate that into a job as a game show host and is instead a sidekick on a streaming show run by ESPN. Perfect team. And now we will swear in the vice president. Oh, no, he tore his Achilles standing up. Damn. The best part of this is the New York Times ruined its own scoop by taking this parade of stoners seriously. Quote, the involvement of Mr. Rogers or of Mr. Ventura could add star power and independent zeal to Mr. Kennedy's outsider bid. Sure, so could the combination of President RFK Jr. and Vice President Donald Trump Jr. Or, 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 President RFK Jr. and, hear me out, President RFK Jr. and Vice President RFK Sr. Huh? Yeah. As to Ventura, who could not beat out somebody named Howie to become nominee for president of the Green Party four years ago, who hasn't been in wrestling since 1990, who hasn't been governor of Minnesota since 2003, who hasn't been on television since MSNBC fired him in October 2003 after like five episodes of a weekend show called Jesse Ventura's America. To this day, Jesse Ventura insists and says he was fired by MSNBC because he opposed the Iraq war. Um, hello? I was on at 8 p.m. on MSNBC, starting eight months before he did. And I outlasted George W. Bush, friend. In fact, and I was part of a small crew trying to prevent him from getting fired because, hell, he would have been better than Joe Scarborough, Jesse Ventura got fired at MSNBC because he couldn't do the television part of the television. I mean, his questions were okay, and he could bluster and pontificate pretty well, but ask him to throw to a commercial to say something like, uh, we'll be right back. And he froze, flatlined. I tried to talk our bosses into hiring somebody as his announcer. I suggested my friend Bill Pito from ESPN. Hi, I'm Bill Pito, and this is Jesse Ventura's America. Okay, Governor, what do you have? And, okay, Governor, time to take a quick break. This is Jesse Ventura's America, please. And to introduce the guest for him, too, because he couldn't do that either. They paid him the full three years left on his contract, so he, too, would make a perfect pairing with RFK if Aaron Rodgers says no or forgets how to speak in human language. With RFK talking like somebody who just had his throat run over by a cactus-covered Humvee. And Jesse talking down here like this, hello. Perfect. So Kennedy and Aaron Rodgers. Or, oh wait, hear me out. Kennedy and, Kennedy and Robert K. Herr. 
because Robert K. Herr is done in the lawyering business. As the kids say, the President Biden special counsel, Mr. Herr, yesterday, where exactly was his head at? I have no idea, but check around the House Judiciary hearing room for it, because long before his hearing yesterday was over, Herr's head had clearly come off his body and rolled away. I mean, after everybody left, did they search hearing room 2141 in the Rayburn building? Because this guy is done. In the single most destructive testimony, self-destructive testimony, since the steroids in baseball hearing 19 years ago this Sunday, when Mark McGuire said he wasn't there to talk about the past, and Sammy Sosa pretended not to speak English, and hell, McGuire should have pretended not to speak English. In the worst work since then, Robert K. Herr was proved a liar who edited out the parts of his own interview with Joe Biden in which he had complimented Biden's memory, who was repeatedly contradicted by the transcript of his own interview with Joe Biden, who started that interview with Biden by literally not knowing what time it was, who misidentified other counsel in the case, and whose mistakes and stupidity and lies were so obvious, so easily proven by his own documents, that all that happened before the Democratic congressman could even get to him, before the hearing even started. And before the hearing even started, Robert Hur's lies were so unavoidable that he was taken apart by Politico, by the Associated Press, by the Washington Post, by CBS News. There was enough time still left before that gavel hit that desk in Rayburn that Robert K. Hur could have told the car service to take him not to Capitol Hill, but to Dulles Airport. And he could have gotten on a plane going anywhere else in the world because anywhere else in the world would have worked out better for him than did hearing room 2141 in Rayburn. The Biden age plot. And I will repeat that the phrase is not mine. It's Politico. The Biden age plot depended on three key moments in the last six days. The MAGA assumption that the president would fall into the orchestra pit during the State of the Union. The, in retrospect, fire everybody assumption that Katie Britt would not be instantly transformed into Sarah Palin levels of punchline-ness. And the saving grace, the person who, if all else failed, and it failed, could still paint an indelible picture of a confused, delusional, dysfunctional, dishonest Joe Biden... And freed from the woke Department of Justice, he could convict President Biden in the court of public opinion. Except Robert K. Hur turned out to be a fraud. And so bad at being a fraud that if you told me he had quit the Department of Justice to avoid being prosecuted by the Department of Justice for professional misconduct, or that he had composed his special counsel's report about Biden entirely by memory without ever consulting the transcript of his interview with Biden, I would believe you. And again, then the hearing started. As soon as they realized what dead weight her was, the Republicans, and I have to say, I predicted this here yesterday, the Republicans turned quickly and venomously on him, and every Democrat on the committee kicked him enough to merit that Simpsons, stop, stop, he's already dead meme. But the kill shot came courtesy Representative Madeline Dean of the Pennsylvania 4th. It's so bad you may want to stand well back from your device as you listen to this because you could still get splattered. Your report on page 208 says that Mr. Biden couldn't come up with the date, the year of his son, Beau Biden's death. When in fact, in the transcript, it shows that you asked him the month. And do you know what he said, Mr. Her? He said, oh, God, May 30th. Would you like to correct the record? His memory was pretty firm on the month and the day. Congresswoman, I don't believe that's correct with respect to the transcript. But if you could refer me to a specific page, I'd be happy to look. Huge mistake, Bobby Herr. From the transcription, uh, page 82, the words are President Biden's. What month did Bo die? Oh, God, May 30th. This is what Robert K. Herr who will be lucky if he comes out of this still having a law license, wrote in his report 
about President Biden. Quote, he did not remember even within several years when his son, Bo, died. And that turns out to have been an utter fabrication. The transcript, the transcript of Robert Hur's interview over two days with Joe Biden, which starts with her saying good morning to Biden and everybody else present, except it was afternoon. The transcript shows her asks Biden about where he kept the papers promulgated after he left the vice presidency in January 2017. And the president answers, quote, I hadn't walked away from the idea that I may run for office again. But if I ran again, I'd be running for president. And and so what was happening, though, what month did Bo die? Oh, God, May 30th. One of his lawyers then interjected 2015. Another person present also said 2015. Biden then says, was it May 2015 he had died? Another unidentified speaker says it was May of 2015. Biden then says it was 2015. Another Biden lawyer reconfirms the year. Robert Hur's deputy then confirms the year. That's it. That was the entire testimony about the death of Bo Biden. He did not remember even within several years when his son, Bo, died. Bullshit. A complete fabrication. Robert K. Hur should be in jail for that because Robert K. Hur was contradicted by Robert K. Hur's own transcript. And he wasn't even smart enough to check the transcript or to anticipate that if he had promised to turn the transcript for political reasons over to the Biden age plot committee, you know, the Department of Justice would have to make it public at some point, too. So the other half of that is when President Biden lashed out at Robert Hur after Hur released his now proven to be fictional special counsel report, when Biden said, how in the hell dare he raise that? He wasn't complaining that Hur had asked him about his son during the interview because Hur hadn't. Biden was complaining about Hur lying about Biden getting the year of his own son's death wrong when he had not gotten the year of his own son's death wrong. And by the way, and I'm sure you have a story like this, too, I think I have asked my sister once a year for five years, 10 years, for the date our mother died. I cannot shake the idea that it was in April because she was a great New York Yankee fan. The first game at the new Yankee Stadium was the same day that she died. So it had to be April, except the first official game in the new Yankee Stadium that counted was in April. The first exhibition game was in March, which is when she died. Sometimes I tell people my mom and dad died in the same year because she died late in March 2009 and he died in the middle of March 2010. Oh, and by the way, Robert Hur had a transcript of what Biden had said about his son, Bo, and his death. Joe Biden didn't. So Hur is not just another corrupt partisan political hitman, Trump whore, posing as a lawyer and a special counsel. He's a stupid, corrupt, partisan political hitman, Trump whore, posing as a lawyer and a special counsel. And oh, by the way, were the committee Republicans enraged about that? Oh, man, about their star witness, the last hope of anything they could throw at Biden, about him being hoisted by the petard that was his own transcript? No. They, they were enraged, all right, but not about the transcript contradicting Robert Hur. They were outraged that the transcript had been released by the Department of Justice. Dan Bishop, Republican, author of an anti-trans bathroom bill from the North Carolina 8, which is also his IQ. Yeah, Dan, they got a lot of nerve releasing your secret evidence, a Department of Justice transcript you guys subpoenaed to the public who paid for it before you could cherry pick something from it. Actually, DOJ did you a favor, Dan Bishop, because you couldn't have cherry picked anything from it. Because on page 47 of the day one transcript, Robert Hur complimented Joe Biden's memory. And he chose to leave that out of the report, too. And when Eric Swalwell nailed her on it, 
Robert Herr couldn't even muster the honesty to say, yeah, I said that. Day one, page 47. You said to President Biden, you have appear to have a photographic understanding and recall of the House. Did you say that to President Biden? Those words do appear on page 47 of the transcript. Photographic is what you said. Is that right? That word does appear on page 47 of the transcript. Never appeared in your report, though. Is that correct? The word photographic? That does not appear in my report. So a cowardly and stupid, corrupt, partisan, political hitman, Trump whore posing as a lawyer and a special counsel. Then... Remember when I said this was the worst congressional testimony since Mark McGuire saying he was not there to talk about the past? Well, Swalwell also gave this nitwit her a chance to at least save his future by saying, of course I'm not doing this because Trump promised me a big job if he's elected. I was a nonpartisan figure at the Department of Justice. Instead, nitwit her said, oh, no, no thanks, Congressman. I'll just twist here. I'll just twist slowly in the wind. You want to be perceived, understandably, as credible. And so I want to first see if you will pledge to not accept an appointment from Donald Trump if he is elected again as president. Congressman, I, I don't, I'm not here to testify Seems like an easy about answer. what will happen it's in the considering future. Considering what I just laid out. I'm here to, I'm here to talk about the, the report and the work yeah. that went into it. And but you don't want to be associated with that guy again, do you? Congressman, I'm not here to offer any opinions about what may or may not happen in the future. I'm here to talk about the work that went into the report, which I stand by. I mean, this guy is an idiot. So much of an idiot that James Comer was not the biggest idiot in that room. Comer says someone named Dana Remus was Biden's White House counsel. And her corrects Comer and says, no, no, Dana Remus was Obama's White House counsel. Except no, Mr. Her, Dana Remus was Biden's White House counsel. Stickler for details, this dude ain't. At another point in the transcript, Her is not sure about a detail about furniture. Three times in nine lines of transcript, Her says he might be misremembering. Later in the transcript, Her's deputy adds a word to a supposed Biden quote and reads it back to Biden. Biden remembers the quote correctly and corrects the guy. And on and on and on and on and on. And then the Republicans went after him because he didn't blow up Biden in the report or obviously in the hearing room. This is Tom Tiffany of the Wisconsin 7th, well known as one of the most gullible of the MAGAs. That's presumably a result of the 20 years that he ran petroleum distribution at places like Zenker Oil. 20 years is a lot of gas fumes to inhale. So I want to thank you for the work that you did as far as you could. But um, unfortunately, you are part of the Praetorian Guard that guards the swamp out here in Washington, D.C., protecting the elites. And Joe Biden is part of that company of the elites. Whatever you say, Karen. I mean, Matt Gates even attacked Bob Herr. Not great, Bob. And so silent, mournful, abandoned, broken. Robert K. Herr recedes into the darkness. He will go into history as a possible fill-in host for the 3 p.m. show on Newsmax. As, how shall I put this? As a sympathetic, well-meaning, middle-aged man with a poor memory. Only without the sympathetic part. Or or the well-meaning part. not discount the reaction to this from the Washington press corps. They ran away from Robert Herr as fast as their cloven feet could carry them. After 17 Biden is demented stories, the Wall Street Journal, president, quote, not stumped on basic factual questions. After 30 Biden is unfit stories in New York Times, Biden, quote, fumbled with dates and the sequence of events while otherwise appearing clear headed. After 33 Biden is troubled stories, the Washington Post, Biden, quote, doesn't come across as being as absent minded as her has made him out to be. 
Associated Press, quote, the full transcript could raise questions about her's depiction of the 81-year-old president as having, quote, significant limitations, unquote, on his memory. The White House correspondent of CBS News, quote, the president was fired up about her's claim that he couldn't remember when his son Bo died because it was false. Everybody got off this Titanic, except a guy named Ken Delanian of NBC News. News and justice correspondent last seen putting up a one source story about more Biden documents being found. His quote, the Robert Herr hearing is a perfect example of what American politics has become. A career public servant spends a year reaching conclusions that are inconvenient for partisans of each party. So they set about questioning his motives and ethics on national television. I'm pushing my oath quota again, but Ken, bullshit. Robert Herr, career public servant? As recently as seven years ago, Robert Herr was at a private D.C. law firm, the 22nd biggest law firm in the world judged by income. Robert Herr was up to his ass in corporate law cash. And 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 ethics? This man doesn't have any any ethics. In essence, he doctored his own transcript of his own interview of the President of the United States, edited out the exculpatory good parts about Biden's memory, fabricated this whole couldn't get the date of his own son's death right bullshit. Clearly had not even read his own transcript where it contradicted him inserted amateur medical opinions of his own into his report, lied, tried to lie at the hearing. And oh, by the way, one party is trying to lie about the mental health of the president of the United States when the brains of its Hitler wannabe candidate are seeping out his own ears. And the other party is trying to stop them and preserve representative government in this country. In this case, stop them by proving their operative Robert K. Herr lied. But that's all the same to this hack Ken Delanian. And... He and NBC News can shove their both sidesism up their asses. Waiting for Kristen Welker on Sunday. Ken Delanian allegedly wrote. Also of interest here, Ken Buck is not just retiring from Congress. The Colorado representative can't stand another goddamned minute of this crap. The Republican majority just drops to two as of the end of next week, he's quitting a special election as early as June 15th. Lauren Boebert can't wait to get her hands all over the special election. New law in Arizona. Students can appeal their grades if they are conservatives, but the professor is liberal. And in North Carolina, the Republicans have nominated for state superintendent of schools a Q moron who believes Jim Carrey drinks the blood of children to look so young and vibrant... Wait, Jim Carrey looks young and vibrant? So this, today, this minute, right now, this may turn out to be the golden age of American education. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Oberman. Ahead of us on this edition of Countdown, things I promised not to tell and shock, shock. We did not win the political podcast of the year at the iHeart Podcast Awards at South by Southwest. Told you so. I mean, it was obvious Pod Save America would win. It was nominated in three different categories, including overall podcast of the year. So it was it was obvious. I do want to congratulate Favreau and Vador and those guys on the award and on surviving their grueling schedule of two episodes a week with only the five different hosts. Karaje, boys! Now, seriously, congratulations. 
Also, it's all rigged. Anyway, seems like a good time to explain the award process. I'm not saying these awards are rigged, I'm sure they're not, but there are ways to actually rig media awards. And with the retrospective period of time of uh, almost, let's see, 35 years, I'll tell you why I now laugh at the story of how NBC gamed the local news Emmys years ago at my expense in things I promise not to tell. First, still more idiots to talk about. The daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. And we begin with an honorary winner, me. Yesterday, I noted that Pope Francis had unfortunately invoked the appeasement of Hitler before and during World War II when he suggested that President Zelensky embrace, quote, the courage of the white flag and surrender to Putin. I mentioned that the World War II popes were Pius VI and Pius VII, and they pretty much told the world to do that with Hitler. Regular listener and longtime friend Charlie Pierce of Esquire reached out yesterday morning to note that Pius VII died in August. August 1823. And Pius VI died in August 1799. So I got the wrong Pi. As Mr. Pierce noted, I meant Pius XI, who died in 1939, and Pius XII. And the 12th, he said, is up for sainthood which would be a big problem for me, obviously, and which would be a big surprise to, you know, German Jews and other Europeans from the 1940s. As I would note, I think this does underscore the real reason that the Roman Empire collapsed. Those goddamned Roman numerals. C, X, V, L, I. I'm not trying to spell the hip version of clicks here. I'm trying to count. Anyway, the Countdown Editorial Board regrets the error, and it has suspended me for my mistake. Okay, I'm back. The suspension was for one second. Now to the winners, the bronze, worse, Michelle Morrow, who won the primary for the election for State Superintendent of Public Instruction in North Carolina. She would be in charge of 2,000 schools and 100,000 teachers. She's a Newsmax writer. She marched in D.C. on January 6th. She said after Pride Month last year, quote, as a nurse, I want you to understand something. There is no pride in perversion. And that is the good part about her. As always, these nitwits like Michelle Morrow never even think to scrub their psycho social media history, which is where we discover that she has written that the country should, quote, ban Islam and, quote, ban Muslims from elected offices. And that was only the sort of bad part. She's also a Q moron. One post. Follow all and retweet Trump 20Q 20Q. Patriots Unite Worldwide WWG 1 WGA, which sadly is not her showing her support for the Writers Guild of America. And even that is only the sort of sort of bad part. Ms. Morrow has also referenced the QAnon theory that Jim Carrey drinks the blood of children in order to stay that young. And you wonder at some point if anybody has seen Jim Carrey. I mean, Jim Carrey, it would be a lot less crazy of a theory if Jim Carrey was not 62 years old, but looked 72 years old. He's drinking blood? It's, uh, evidently, it doesn't do anything for you. Assholes. Just all assholes. And even that is only the sorta of, sorta of bad part. This Moro woman has referenced the QAnon theory that the actor and comedian Jim Carrey drinks the blood of children in order to stay that young. Does anybody in QAnon look at look at anything but QAnon crap online? Like a picture of Jim Carrey? I mean it would be a lot less crazy of a theory. If Jim Carrey was not 62 years old, but looks more like 72. I mean, if he's drinking blood, evidently it does nothing for you. Your Republican nominee for superintendent of schools for all of North Carolina, who should not be allowed out of her house unless she's wearing a leash, Michelle Morrow. And in this context, she's both dumb and dumber. The runner-up, Worser, and continuing this theme, Republican State Senator Anthony Kern of Arizona, who has hit the nail on the head with what is wrong with this country. Half of the nation, idiots. 
measurable, factually provable boneheads. Senator Kern has introduced Arizona Senate Bill 1477, which will fix all that in his state. It will establish the Arizona Grade Challenge Board, which will allow any student at any Arizona public university to demand that their instructor reevaluate their exam grade or even their entire course grade if the student files an allegation of bias. Not racial bias, not religious bias, not gender bias, not LGBTQ bias, only political bias. This is the gist of our unsolvable national problem. Half the country believes it cannot possibly be wrong. It cannot possibly be stupid. It cannot possibly have gotten a C minus in geometry. It has to be because the teacher is a liberal. It was Oliver Cromwell who said, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ to think it possible you may be mistaken. But of course, these idiot students in Arizona for whom the bias board grade challenge as being established, they've never heard of Oliver Cromwell or Oliver Hardy or Lawrence Olivier because they're so smart they don't need to know who those people are. And if the answer on the exam is Oliver Cromwell and they instead write Carrie Lake and they get a C minus, it's because uh, the, the professor's too woke. The system is biased against me, which is true. The system is biased against them. It's supposed to be because they're stupid. And some people are irredeemably stupid. But now this system is broken and they can vote themselves smart. And I don't know how to fix this. More importantly, I don't know how to weed out the really stupid people like the Arizona State Senator Anthony Kern, who is stupid, and his colleagues in the Senate and the State House, the Republicans in Arizona, who approved his bill. Happily, they did not approve it by a big enough margin to override the upcoming governor veto, after which they will say the governor vetoed it because she's a liberal and they're conservatives. And we start the whole cycle over again. No, she vetoed it because you're idiots. But the winner, the worst, speaking of idiots, Governor Christy Nome of South Dakota, who has done a personal testimonial commercial for some cosmetic dentistry place in Texas. This is four minutes and 51 seconds on Twitter in which she talks about how they gave her a new smile and she's so grateful because her orthodontist uncle would not fix her teeth when she was a kid and, and she's always suffered because of that and, and, and total loss of, well, I guess credibility is the right word here. She looks straight into the camera for four minutes and 51 seconds and ad libs about her smile and how perfect it is now. I mean, she didn't have much credibility to start with, but she's now Governor Infomercial. I mean, six years ago, Governor Teeth launched a campaign in South Dakota. Christy Nome's campaign against crystal meth, and Christy Nome named it Meth. We're on it. This is an advertising genius right here. And if you don't agree, it's because you're woke. As an aside, can we start calling these ads on Twitter what they have now become? Spam? Governor Christie, do you kiss your husband with that infomercial mouth of yours? And Corey Lewandowski? Gnome, two days! Worst person in the world! the number one story on the countdown and my favorite topic me and things i promised not to tell the website the athletic has reported that my old friends at espn had for years been gaming the system at the sports emmy awards bribing voters no trying to push the voting by nominating stories about the judges or about the places they were from no otherwise tampering with the process of who got nominated or who won or anything like that? No. Their crime was adding to the list of nominees fictional names so that if their shows won, 
they would be able to get extra trophies that could be re-engraved and given to people who were not eligible to win those Emmy Awards. Those people were the hosts and reporters of the show. Rather incredibly, until the last few years, if a network submitted one of its shows for best studio sportscast or one of several other categories, virtually everybody who worked on the show was eligible. NBC won the Emmy for the Outstanding Live Sports Special in 2022, and NBC, in its submission, listed all the executives, the producers, the directors, the associate producers, everybody down to the stage managers. Literally 365 different sports people. And if they shelled out the money or if the network did it for them, they all got an actual Emmy Award. Not one anchor or reporter among them. Now, obviously, this concerns me far more than it does you. And don't get me wrong, I do not begrudge any of those 365 winners their Emmys, including the nine stage managers, and it looks like I worked with like three of them, and they were great. Counting them up, I saw literally dozens of names of friends and former colleagues, and they were all great. But... The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences did not permit adding even just the lead anchors and reporters from the 2022 Olympics or any other nominated best show if they were on the air. The official explanation for this curiosity was they didn't want anybody, quote, double dipping, getting an award for best anchor, best reporter, and getting another Emmy if the show they were anchoring won best show. There are just five different categories for people on the air in the sports Emmys. That's it. 365 Emmys were given out to the producers and stage managers from the Olympics, and five were given out to all the people on the air at the Olympics, on the NBA broadcasts, football play-by-play, sports centers, post-game shows, pardon the interruptions, baseball, curling, darts, whatever. Now, practically speaking, that is not literally true. Because of the ESPN dodge, which I will grant is hilarious and which I'll get to in a moment. But there was also the dodge used by MLB Network and other operations over the years. In 2020, when its show MLB Tonight won the Emmy for Best Daily Live Sports Series, MLB Network submitted the name of 63 different producers. Among them were Greg Amsinger, and that's a coincidence, There's also a Greg Amsinger who was the primary anchor of MLB Tonight. And then there's a producer named Bob Costas. Huh. And another producer named Peter Gammons. And my friends Ron Darling, producer, and ex-Yankees manager Joe Girardi, producer, and Harold Reynolds, producer, who I've known for 33 years, and baseball Hall of Famers Pedro Martinez, producer, and Jim Tomey, producer who I once nearly ran over with a golf cart in Arizona, but I'll tell that story some other time. Pedro Martinez, who I got started in television at Turner in 2013, won an Emmy in 2020 as a producer of MLB Tonight. Not as an analyst, because you couldn't give an Emmy to an analyst, even if he was the best thing on MLB Tonight, if he was. No Emmys for those lousy talent. Didn't they get enough honors as it is? We're giving out five of them. And money, don't they get all the money? And you know what? That's fine, too. From my first day in television, August 3rd, 1981, somewhere around 1, 2 p.m., the fourth or fifth hour of my television career, I thought, and I think I said it aloud to the producer, that I did not understand why anybody would work in television if they were not on the air. If the job fills the yawning maw of your insatiable ego, you know, like it does mine, that's great. Makes sense. Being on TV has given purpose to the lives of lots of us who would otherwise have spent our entire lives just standing in front of a mirror talking to ourselves. Maybe holding a microphone as we did so. A microphone that was not plugged into anything. But... There are only two things that ever bring any attention to these sports Emmy Awards and the news Emmys and the entertainment Emmys. How many awards go to each network and who won those five little awards for best sports personalities? Maybe once in a while, an unlikely show will win for best studio show and it will get a little attention on Twitter for like three hours. 
But otherwise, nobody writes up those 365 different trophies given out to NBC's 2022 Olympic non-on-air staff. And I think there is a little hypocrisy here because the on-air people are used for publicity, such as it is, while there was this horrible fear that they might win too many awards for just one show or that adding them to the list of the real nominees would make the lists too long. I mean, 365 Olympic Emmy Award winners is just right. But 385 would have been a nightmarish embarrassment. Anyway, finally to the athletic report on how ESPN gamed the system until the rule about, quote, talent, unquote, was changed for, I believe, 2023. I'll quote a part of the athletic story. The Emmy administrators, quote, uncovered a scheme that the network used to acquire more than 30 of the coveted statuettes for on-air talent ineligible to receive them. Since at least 2010, ESPN inserted fake names in Emmy entries, then took the awards won by some of these imaginary individuals, had them re-engraved, and gave them to on-air personalities. Ooh. Describing this as fraud and as ill-gotten Emmys, Katie Strang of The Athletic somehow managed to sleuth out this clever, almost indecipherable series of immoral substitutions. Quoting her again, names similar to the names of on-air personalities and with identical initials were listed all under the title of associate producers. Ms. Strang gave the fake names and then helpfully followed the fake names with parentheses, which contained the real names of those evil talent who by fraud and deception and trickery and an utter disregard for the sacred sanctity of the Emmy Awards took possession of young, unsuspecting, and vulnerable trophies that they did not deserve. Quote, Kirk Henry, parenthesis, Kirk Herbstreet, Lee Clark, parenthesis, Lee Corso, Dirk Howard, parenthesis, Desmond Howard, and Tim Richard, parenthesis, Tom Rinaldi, Stephen Ponder, parentheses, Sam Ponder, and Gene Wilson, Gene Wojciechowski, Chris Fulton, Chris Fowler, tell Fowler I can hear him, and Shelly Saunders, Shelly Smith. How did anyone ever figure out these aliases reflective of evil masterminds at ESPN? My God, did the Athletic hire the World War II code breakers from Bletchley Park? Who would have ever believed that Dirk Howard and Desmond Howard were the same person? I bet some of those crack MLB Tonight MLB Network producers could have done that detective work. Producer Pedro Martinez, perhaps, or producer Jim Tomey. Or producer Bill Ripken, Cal's brother. Seriously, don't those names seem a little too obvious? I mean, if you're trying to trick somebody into thinking the award is not for Sam Ponder, why do you write Stephen Ponder? Somebody observed on social media that these names sound like the names in a sports video game when you can't get the rights to the real players' names. Why is the Kansas City quarterback named Patrick Your Holmes? The Emmys did not crack down on MLB Network, as near as I know anyway. It certainly wasn't mentioned in the athletic piece. It did not crack down on MLB Network listing all of its on-air guys as producers so they could get trophies. Doesn't it seem plausible that the use of the phony names... And phony is doing a lot of work in this sentence. The use of the barely phony names... Was the Emmy committee looking the other way as ESPN tried to get a couple of trophies for its reporters and anchors? I mean, 30 over 13 years, that's not a lot. The problem here is somebody at the Emmys found out, called ESPN on it. ESPN made those on-air people give the trophies back. And there is, at least in the Athletics article, the implication that maybe a couple of producers were fired by ESPN for doing this. It's madness. And there are two other serious components to this, and obviously one of them is going to be about me. I have been nominated for like 15 Emmys over the years, 20, 25, local sports, network sports, network news. I have never won. 
I am the Susan Lucci of sports and news Emmys. Actually, that is a bad comp. Susan Lucci finally won an Emmy in 1999. Me, I am O since 1981. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this, none of which really matters, but the primary of which is roll of the dice. I got nominated against Bob Costas twice in three years in the 90s, and who's going to win that battle? He would. He did. Then he came over sheepishly and he apologized. Why the guys who are only on once a week like me are pitted against the guys who are on every night like you, I can't understand. If Bob had not been a great friend of mine before that, he sealed it with that remark. On the other hand, there was a lot of corruption in the local Emmys. They are judged by panels in other cities, or at least they were when I was in local news, and in early 1988, apparently, the news director of the NBC affiliated station in Toledo, Ohio, found out that Emmy voters in Toledo would be voting on that year's awards for Los Angeles. So somebody thought, let's game this system. The awards submitted by KNBC in Los Angeles for best sports reporting for 1988 was about Morgana the Kissing Bandit the buxom dancer who used to run onto the field during baseball games and kiss the players. And she lived in Toledo, Ohio. So sure enough, that year, the guy at KNBC in Los Angeles beat me out for best local TV sports reporting in Los Angeles because he had submitted a report consisting entirely of Benny Hill-style sight gags in which Morgana the Kissing Bandit of Toledo, Ohio, chased him around. All I had in my lousy submission was the day I exclusively broke the story that the Los Angeles Kings were trading five players and $15 million to Edmonton for Wayne Gretzky. Great report, loser. I know. What kind of reporting is that compared to Morgana the Kissing Bandit? So anyway, when they gave him that award, my girlfriend and my agent and I stood up and left. But I'm not a bad loser. Just a vengeful one. One year I was really pissed about not getting an Emmy. In 1999 and 2000, in addition to five nights a week on the Fox cable version of SportsCenter, I also hosted the pregame and postgame shows wrapping around the Fox Network Baseball Game of the Week. These were, to say the least, arduous days, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. on a Saturday, invariably a beautiful day in Southern California. And it was made doubly arduous by my analyst. Steve Lyons, as sleazy and as disagreeable man as anybody with whom I have ever worked. Steve Lyons made homophobic jokes on the air. He criticized a Jewish player for not playing on Yom Kippur. He implied a Latino manager had stolen his wallet. Later, his career ended after a domestic battery charge. And when he wasn't doing all that, Lyons mastered and specialized in one other thing complaining. I mean, the makeup artist on our show once thanked me for never complaining, and I said, but I complain all the time. And she said, not even close. Anyway, two years of this. The first year, 1999, the winner for the Emmy for Best Live Studio Sports Show was not SportsCenter, was not the NFL Today on CBS, it was Fox MLB pregame, me and Lions. He did not get an Emmy. I did not get an Emmy. The producers got Emmys. To their credit, the people at Fox said they were going to try to get me one, and they did not succeed. It was against the rules. And we had not thought of the little bit of a deke here and putting me in as an associate producer under the name Teeth Olderman. The next year, 2000, the winner for the Emmy for the Best Studio Analyst was Steve Lyons. He got an Emmy. My boss on the show said not only should I have gotten his Emmy, but, quote, you should have gotten a second one for carrying that buffoon on your back every week. But personal whining aside, I mean, honestly, what would happen if I won an Emmy now for some reason? I mean, you think anybody would ever remember that? If I am remembered, it'll be for not ever winning an Emmy. 
I keep coming back to this idea, finally corrected in 2022, that the awards are for the producers and not those whiny prima donnas, the talent. When I was 29, I moved from one L.A. TV station to another. In fact, it was just a couple of weeks after that Gretzky story that lost out to Morgana the Kissing Bandit. The news station was KCBS, and I already knew everybody there because for three years I had been popping by their station every day to do afternoon drive sportscasts on their all-news radio station. And I had gotten to know and delight in knowing the company of one of my fellow KNX and soon-to-be KCBS sportscasters, Gil Stratton. Gil had been the first sports guy on the local news in L.A. in 1954, and he did the play-by-play for the Rams games on the CBS network, and they wanted him to move to New York to be the face of CBS sports. Are you kidding? Gil told them. I'm from New York. Why would I leave L.A. to move back to New York? In L.A., Gil was the star until he retired to Hawaii to run his own radio station in about 1976. It didn't go well. And now, again, we're in 1988, he was back in L.A., but at the bottom of the L.A. sports totem pole, Saturday mornings on radio, he was the backups, backup on television, and Gil did not care. Beats a real job, he used to tell me with a smile. Plus, I make more now in this building than I did 15 years ago, even adjusted for inflation. Anyway, if the name Gil Stratton seems vaguely familiar to you, or maybe more than vaguely, it was because he was also an actor. I hope you have seen the movie Stalag 17, one of the all-time classics about prisoners in a World War II military prison camp in Germany. If you haven't seen it, turn off the podcast, go watch the movie, then come back to me. Stalag 17. William Holden is the star. His right-hand man is Gil Stratton. Gil was also in The Wild One with Marlon Brando and in Girl Crazy with Judy Garland and about two dozen TV series, and he spent a year as a lead in a Broadway musical. The day before I was to join Channel 2 as sports director and nominally as Gil's boss, Gil sat me down in the lunchroom and said he wanted to warn me about something. You need to know, he said, that the executives here are the biggest bunch of prima donnas I have ever seen. The general manager sent me on an assignment for the station, and they had gotten everything wrong. Wrong city, wrong building, wrong day, wrong person to interview. When I got back and told him I had managed to get him a soundbite, despite all the screw-ups, but that was going to be it, he burst into tears. Gil laughed. And while I'm at it, you're young enough, maybe you you still believe that, that we are the prima donnas? Take it from me. I've been doing this and Hollywood and Broadway for 47 years. The producers and the studio executives and the TV executives have created this fiction that we are all impossibly difficult to work with and we are all ego. And it's them. They are the prima donnas. Listen, I rode motorcycles, Gil said, with Brando. I chased girls with Holden. I kissed Judy Garland flush on the lips. And they were all supposed to be prima donnas, and none of them, not even Judy Garland on her worst day, was as much of a prima donna as the blasted general manager of this television station. So needless to say, there is an existential dispute here. We get the money and the fame, or what's left of the money and the fame now that television is dying, in exchange for which we get all the pot shots. And the athletic piece about the fake names, and I left out Eric Andrews, which apparently was code for Aaron Andrews. They changed one letter. Genius. I mean, as unsolvable as the Sphinx. Who would ever know that Eric Andrews was supposed to be Aaron Andrews? The athletic piece about the fake name contained one anonymous pot shot that really underscored the everlasting lie that Gil Stratton told me about so many years ago. Quote, When asked why people at the network would scheme to secure trophies for on-air talent, one person involved in the ESPN Emmy submission process in recent years said, quote, you have to remember that those personalities are so important and they have egos. Uh, Tell me again 
who submitted a list of 365 NBC producers and directors and stage managers for an Emmy for one Olympics? Was it Judy Garland on her worst day, or was it an off-air television executive? I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on the guitars, bass, and drums, and Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards, and it was produced by TKO Brothers. And I'm only sorry we did not win Political Podcast of the Year Award because they would have gotten statues too. Probably. I don't know how this works. And when I say I'm only concerned because it affects them, I'm lying. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olbermann theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. And frankly, the way things have been going in Bristol, the podcast of the year, political podcast of the year award would have been a, like a big highlight of the year for them. So I'm sorry on their behalf, too. Only on their behalf. And, and when I say only on their behalf, I'm lying. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever, so she didn't need the award. Our announcer today was my friend Stevie Van Zant, like he needs awards. Everything else was pretty much my fault. So that's Countdown for this 238th day before the 2024 presidential election and the 1,163rd day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Use the 14th Amendment, the not regularly given elector objection option, the Insurrection Act, the justice system, the mental health system to stop him from doing it again while we still can. And as we list countdowns, what is it like? The 33rd day before the premiere of the Robert K. Herr show on Flomax? Newsmax, sorry. You know, when you turn 65, you actually shouldn't make jokes about Flomax, Keith. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news warrants. A steady stream of bulletins as the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Ulrimen. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck. Good luck.